if anybody's been paying attention, global sea surface temperatures just hit a new record all-time high. So we have never been that high before. So the oceans globally have never been this hot. Uh, as far as humans have been around in any sort of modern fashion, we've never seen temperatures like this. We've never had to try to adjust to weather like this. I think uh, big changes are coming, and I think big changes are coming soon. And uh, we are in the middle of the first phase of total chaos in the climate casino. Welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Charles, and I'll be your host. Our topic today, chaos in the climate casino. And for this topic, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Elliot Jacobson. Dr. Jacobson is a retired professor of mathematics, computer science, as well as a casino industry consultant. He has authored four books, three on casino games, and one poetry book. Since retiring in 2017, he has become very well known in the climate world as a climate researcher appearing recently on CNN, as well as many climate-oriented programs. He also has a large number of followers on Twitter. Dr. Jacobson, can you share with us today your knowledge about the 1.5 degree IPCC temperature goal. Well, thank you so much for having me on the program. This is an honor. I have great respect for this program and have enjoyed it for a long time. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say happy birthday to all of us, because as of March 6th, it will be uh, one year since the North Atlantic set an all-time temperature record. Well, modern era since they've been keeping track. So we have a birthday to celebrate. I don't know how much uh, joy we should really get out of it because it has certainly created a lot of climate chaos all over the planet. But before I, we get into a topic about like that, what I want to talk about is just this idea of what 1.5 is. I have been, and I don't know about other people out there, I've been personally very annoyed at the climate uh, science universe for sort of this inarticulate way of describing how much we are above the uh, pre-industrial 1850 to 1900 IPCC baseline. If you go looking for numbers, you will see people saying 1.1, 1.2. You'll hear numbers like that, right? Recently, the Met put out the highest number I had heard to date, which is 1.26C above the baseline. None of that felt right to me. Uh, so I decided to sort of look into it further. And it turns out what the Met did that got the higher value than previous is they actually looked at a 20-year uh, window of time. Rather than looking back into history, what they did is looked at 10 years of history and 10 years of forecast temperatures into the future using their models. And then they took the average of those 20 years sort of centered on today. Now, the problem with their analysis was that, um, first of all, they assume that a decadal warming is only 0.2 C. In other words, the temperature is rising about 0.2 C per decade. And the second problem with their analysis is that they use sort of a different baseline than, for example, Copernicus uh, ERA-5 uses. And their, their baseline is slightly more generous. In other words, it gets the temperatures to be slightly lower, uh, the anomaly. So what I did was I went to the um, Copernicus data, uh, which starts in 1940, and they also give you their 1850 to 1900 baseline. And the first thing I did was to recompute the decadal warming. And what I found was not a value of 0.2 C per decade, but a value of 0.3 C per decade in rise. And after I, I got that value, I put a post up on Twitter saying that. And, all, and in the next week, I actually found two other climate scientists out there who were affirming that, yes, right now the rate of warming is 0.3 C. So I used that rate of warming, and then I used the data from Copernicus. 
And I came up with a current value of 1.38 C as the amount we were above the 1850 to 1900 baseline. You won't hear anybody else saying that. But the other thing is that once you understand that we're warming at 0.3 C per decade, the other implication of that is we're going to bust through 1.5 by 2028 or so. Just, just it'll be in the rear view mirror by 2028. Now, I decided to do a secondary check of that using um, something that Michael Mann has often said, which is that it's really all about the trend line. When you talk about the Paris Agreement, you're talking about the trend line. What is the trend line for the current temperature? And so, you know, the problem with trend lines is sort of the further back you go, the less you are into the sort of accelerated warming period. So I decided just to go back 15 years and compute a trend line for the last 15 years in which you can really see that warming has taken off. And that sort of corresponds to the Earth energy imbalance nearly quadrupling you know, over the last 20 years. And when you look at that trend line, and this is, again, Michael Mann, who might say that the current anomaly is 1.2. But when you look at the trend line for the last 15 years, looking at every single day's temperature for the last 15 years, you come out to 1.39 C, right? An incredible sort of um, correlation with the other way of doing this computation. So I just wanted to say that because there's been a lot of debate out there. What does it mean? Is it a, a value based on one year? Is it a value based on looking back 30 years or looking back 20 years? Is it a trend line value? Is it, as the Met says, 10 years in the past and 10 years in the future? And I just, I, I think this question has to be answered or else we're sort of in this era of people just making things up right? Just, just making it up on the spot. And, and what are they making up? Well, every time somebody says, hey, we're going to cross 1.5, they kind of change the way they're computing it. You know, oh, no, 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 we're not past that yet because we should be looking at it this way or that way, right? So let's just call it 1.4C. What does 1.4C really mean? And that's where we are today, right? Well, every one degree Celsius is what, about 7% more atmospheric uh, moisture, right? So if we're at 1.4 C, well, you can do the computation, right? That is almost, or let's just call it rounding off, 10% more atmospheric uh, moisture than pre-industrial. And what's happening to that atmospheric moisture? Well, we've always had El Niños, right? We've always had atmospheric rivers, but now we're having these things sort of uh, supercharged but this huge amount of moisture. And this is not being evenly distributed over the planet, right? There's uh, fires in Texas and there, there's droughts uh, on the Horn of Africa, right? This moisture is being focused into the storms now. And whether they're going to be hurricanes or atmospheric rivers or whatever they're going to be, um, the monsoons, the, the rain that's now happening is just off the charts. Um, last year, 22-23, we were in the middle of a La Nina. Santa Barbara's reservoirs were getting, that's where I live, were getting low, right? We're getting very low. Well, nobody thought a La Nina year could fill up the reservoirs. Not only did they fill, you know, they overflowed here. And then the next year is, a, is an El Nino. And guess what? In the month of February that just passed, we had as much rain in February as we typically do in an entire year here in Santa Barbara. So this is, you know, <laughs> this is the impact of, of what the temperature really genuinely is, which in my opinion is currently 1.4 C. So I just, I just think the impact of that, right? The impact of where we are with respect to the North Atlantic and global sea surface temperatures too, by the way, if, if anybody's been paying attention, global sea surface temperatures just hit a new record all time high uh, today. Well, today is yesterday's reading of 21.15 Celsius. So we have never been that high before. So the oceans globally have never been this hot. Um, we've never had, uh, as far as humans have been around in any sort of modern fashion, we've never seen temperatures like this. We've never had to try to adjust to weather like this. I think uh, big changes are coming and I think big changes are coming soon. And uh, we are in the middle of the first phase of total chaos in the climate casino. Thank you very much, Elliot, for the information you provided. I would like to hand it over to Paul to comment on what you've said. Yes, uh, thank you, Elliot. I mean, I agree completely um, with you. I mean, the 1.5 uh, 
uh, degree Celsius number and the two degree Celsius number that so many policymakers and government officials talk about, I would be willing to wager that most of them have no idea what it really means. Do they mean that temperature in a day, in a year, a moving average? So since we basically crossed it, 1.5 for an entire year and individual days, we've actually crossed uh, two degrees Celsius, you know, on individual days, it became um, imperative that the UN kind of define what they mean. And, and now they're talking about this uh, basically 10 year moving average or 20 year average. When you say the Met, are you talking about what are you, who are you referring to exactly? Um, UK weather uh, metropolitan. The, the UK. Yeah, UK right. weather. Okay, yeah, that, that's what I thought. So, and again, those numbers are so dependent on the baseline. And if you look back at when those numbers were first discussed in UN reports and at climate conferences, the baseline was originally 1750, defining the start of the Industrial Revolution. And of course, that slid to most people use 1850 to 1900 now. I've also seen 1880 to 1920. And there's obviously a temperature rise from 1750 to these new baselines. If you just kind of look on the plot, you might say it's 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 Celsius. It's probably, you know, and there are some, there is a paper that says it's about 0 0.15 Celsius a shift. So there's even, um, questions and what the actual shift is, but it definitely adds to any of the temperatures that we're talking about. It's not a very good metric. I mean, I like James Hansen's uh, work where he talks about the earth energy imbalance. You know, that's a very simple concept. If there's more energy coming in than going out, then the earth is going to warm. And that imbalance is increasing more and more. It's, uh, you know, in the last two decades has gone up, you know, remarkably high. You know, none of us live in this in an average climate, of course. You know, we all experience the uh, variability and the variability. So it's not just the temperature that's rising, but, but the variability seems to be increasing significantly. So, you know, I've often called it global or weather whiplashing or weather wilding or weather weirding. You know, you can choose, choose which phrase you want. You know, the whiplashing, obviously, where we shoot from very hot to very warm, very cold, and, and, and so on. You know, we're seeing climate disruption around the world, clearly. James Hansen is attributing a lot of the additional acceleration of warming to a reduction of sulfur in marine shipping fuels. His work always basically shows that we're up to about 2010, we we're increasing 0 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. And then since then, we've increased, you know, the increase has gone up 50 to 100%. So he has it between 0 0.27 Celsius and 0 0.36 Celsius. So you're you're saying, you know, your number is right in, in the middle there. Yeah, I mean, we're going to have a problem with our global food supply, I think, is, is probably humanity's most vulnerable point. I guess, um, now, you, you call yourself a doomer. Is that, It's funny, because I never call myself a doomer. I always think there's like a glimmer of hope. I talk about a three-legged fire stool, you know, slash fossil fuel emissions take carbon out of the atmosphere using, you know, carbon dioxide removal techniques. And actually the UN uh, environmental program is talking about that now in their reports. And then what they don't like to talk about is SRM or solar radiation management. So I always, you know, think there's, you know, a part of the human condition is hope. If we don't have hope, I mean, <laughs> you know, what keeps us going? So I don't know. I mean, do you call yourself a doomer? Do you have any hope at all that we can turn the ship around? Well, there was a lot of what you just said right there uh, to respond to. Um, I don't know how much of that I, I yeah, really no, should no, get just, into. Uh, but... I mean, are, are you, uh, do you think some of these uh, carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management techniques will be able to scale up to actually make, make some sort of difference? Well, okay. So as, as Johan Rockstrom said, right, when he's talking about um, all of the planetary boundaries, right? There are, are six of, of the nine that we're outside of. And he said that climate change is the easiest one of those to bring back inside the boundaries. But even to uh, get climate you know, back inside a, a habitable, human habitable space, we need not only to do the uh, geoengineering 
right? We need all of the other um, parts of that too, which uh, include reducing fossil fuel use by 50% by the end of the decade and, um, uh, you know, rewilding or, or not degrading the biosphere anymore um, and on and on, right? And this is just to sort of stop the feedback loops that are, are going to sort of uh, make the, the climate uh, stumble forward in, into even hotter mm -hmm. spaces. So, um, yeah, from a perspective of a single problem, it may be the case that we can uh, manage the climate uh, below 2.7, which is where it's sort of currently heading uh, using all of the sort of current commitments that governments have made, not to make, not to say they will carry through with those commitments, but there's all the other add-ons to that, right? How are we going to preserve um, even the ozone that we've, we've apparently solved, but now <laughs> looks like there might be a new issue with satellites, you know, and their debris uh, affecting um, high altitude clouds uh, over the, the pole. I mean, the, the problems are just so beyond the sort of this simple notion of climate that it's really hard for me to just say, oh, yes, we can we can solve the climate if we all get together and sing Kumbaya for the next 30 yeah. years. And, and think that that's the end. It's not. I mean, there, there's so much more than that. So in the sort of larger perspective, um, sort of this myopic focus on climate uh, is something that that when you talk about hope, you uh, uh, most people just stick to climate, right? They don't, they yeah, don't they include don't. biodiversity. They don't include nitrogen, phosphorus, you know, and other chemical pollution. They don't, you know, include tipping points that are going to get breached as we overshoot 1.5 in the next 30 years, right? And all these other things. So thank you very much, Paul. And uh, thank you, Elliot, for your response. And now I'd like to give uh, Peter a chance to... Uh, to say some things and, and to uh, discuss with you. So it's absolutely uh, great to have Professor Elliot Jack Jacobson with us. He uh, posts very frequently, like I do, on, on Twitter. He brings a, a lot of clarity into uh, climate science. And um, unfortunately, I have to say that the climate experts have uh, brought little clarity into the situation. They're complicating and confusing the reality of the science, which is absolutely extraordinary. Now, I, yeah, I agree with Paul that, um, uh, that the uh, global average temperature increase, the global warming, as a single metric is a very, very poor one. I should say a word about, uh, about its origins, by the way. The EU brought in 2 degrees C in 1996. And then um, uh, 1.5 C, people will be surprised. It actually started with the Copenhagen Conference in 2009. Uh, by that time, the most vulnerable uh, countries had been uh, screaming and yelling and uh, pushing the richer countries um, to uh, change the 2 C and put it down to 1.5. This goes back a long way. And their reason was that they literally couldn't survive on 1.5 degrees C. So Copenhagen, that strange Copenhagen Accord, which was a great disappointment for everybody, that said in it, and we will consider um, strengthening to 1.5 degrees C. Of course, it took um, over a decade um, really for anything to happen on, on that at all. The other point is we shouldn't actually be using this metric at all. Um, the 1992 Climate Change Convention, in which uh, countries agreed, and they said they would, um, limit uh, climate change to uh, avoid dangerous interference with the climate system, the metric was quite properly, quote, atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. That's a good metric. Um, it gives you ocean acidification for example, right? Um, and it gives you um, uh, commitment. It gives you a sense, at least, of how high you're going to go beyond where we are today. And of course, we've always known it would be higher. So now we have the uh, majority of the climate scientists, I think James Hansen is the only exception, who are still saying that, no, it's not too late. Don't say it's too late. Um, uh, we can limit to 1.5 degrees C. Well, it's absolutely absurd. It's preposterous. It's a thoroughly bad thing to be saying, 
right? Uh, in my, in my view, so I really would agree with you there, Elliot. I really would agree with that one. Extreme weather events, interestingly, uh, BAMS, a bulletining of bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, no less. They brought out their 11th um, uh, extreme weather event sort of um, multi-publication. And uh, yeah, really um, practically all of the uh, extreme weather events that we're getting, they put the attribution down to it's being driven by climate change. I want to say something about the doom word. So it appears to me that uh, don't say doom is rather like don't look up. And the scientists who have very been very aggressive, by the way, very aggressive in, in actually saying that people who talk about doom and climate change are even worse than the climate deniers, right? The fact is that our governments, our fossil fuel corporations, and our banks have already doomed our future. The future is not going to be a, a good future at all. And it's going to be made even worse because the IPCC recommendation, no less, that emissions be put into immediate and rapid decline has not been repeated by one climate expert, not one. If you want to avoid a, a doomier future, why the hell wouldn't you be shouting from the rooftops that the IPCC6 assessment, no less, said that we had to have immediate decline. And it was in the last climate conference. The uh, new IPCC chair stated that if, it, if we didn't put emissions into decline immediately and rapidly, quote, we would not meet the Paris Agreement. So I'm more than frustrated at um, uh, the uh, climate experts basically telling the wrong story and certainly not telling the truth. So thank you for being a uh, voice of clarity and um, uh, being brave enough <laughs> to say the don't say doom word. Well, okay. okay. Well, thank you, Peter, uh, for that contribution. I would like to just ask a few questions I've prepared prior to meeting here. Elliot, can we continue to talk about risk in the classical sense in terms of the probability of these extreme events? So th that's a great question. I think the answer is going to be simple. No, we can't. Um, there is simply no way that you can use sort of a, a model that involves, say, an, a Gaussian distribution and assume that that it applies in any future sense to get um, odds for things happening. And uh, so, no, you can't, but you can still talk about metrics like standard deviation. You just cannot reliably translate those to risk or odds of an event happening um, by using a Gaussian distribution. So, you know, this, the when sea surface temperatures are five or six sigma above a very recent baseline, it should just stun everybody, right? It should just knock you off your chair. It doesn't anymore, right? We've already sort of gotten used to this. Um, so yeah, risk in its classical sense, uh, I don't really have a model for when conditions are changing this fast because we simply don't know what things are right now today. I mean, you look at what happened last year with sort of this simultaneous um, North Atlantic sea surface temperatures, global sea surface temperatures, global two meter air temperatures, Antarctic sea ice extent, all simultaneously setting records at the same time, right? Uh, Zeke Hausfather's response to that was that, you know, gobsmacking bananas, right? You, you just have this, this sort of sense that, that um, there is no model in which people expected things to be what they are today. And I think any uh, association of a risk number with that is, is going to be artificial at best. Thank you. Uh, I'll bring up uh, one more question here. You're a mathematician, and so I thought maybe, you know, you would have some insight into what the insurance companies must be facing in terms of their actuarial assessments of risk 
to property given uh, you know the um rather abrupt changes we're experiencing on the weather front so insurance companies we we see what's happening with the rates that um they're charging right so automobile rates are going up uh, home insurance uh you know, people are moving out of Florida. In, in the whole United States right now, there are more sort of, I got to get out of here fast. I'm a motivated seller. Uh, you know, four times as many in Florida as the next part of a state in the country. People are starting to realize that that these places are going to become uninhabitable soon, and they're starting to, to emigrate away. Um, one thing about the insurance industry is that they mitigate risk. So when there's a high-risk place, they, they're still charging they can overcharge a low risk place to compensate for the risk to the high. It's not that every location should be charged proportionally to the risk of living there, right? You can you can spread the risk around. But when it comes to the fact that that there is essentially no place that's safe anymore, whether it's going to be hurricanes or fires or floods or uh, heat waves, you know, or um, rivers or, or uh, reservoirs going dry or, or, you know, whatever it is. When when it comes to the fact that there's no safe place anymore, then essentially uh, insurance has to collapse, right? And so we're right at the beginning of seeing the insurance industry collapse. And we're watching that in real time as, it, as it's pulling out of markets, right, that are its highest risk. And that leaves, you know, sort of the insurance of last resort, which is the government to offer policies, which are super high priced with low benefits. But, but you know, that's all that's left for a lot of people. Where I live here in Santa Barbara, right across the street from me, you cannot get fire insurance anymore. All right. I, I live on one side of a county road. And if you're on the other side of the county road, that's sort of more in the mountains. They won't insure people up there anymore. Right. So that's that's how close it is for me personally. I think the insurance company is a great bellwether for um, climate. Thank you for that, Elliot. I'd like to turn it over to Paul. Paul, do you have any questions for Elliot? Yeah, um, I guess you were referring to wildfire risk. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. So generally, when when California gets very wet winters and very wet springs, you get a lot of growth, of course, of vegetation. And if you have a very, very dry summer, hot, humid, dry summer, then the wildfire risk is just going to go off the chart. You know, Canada was horrible. And of course, now, you know, Texas Panhandle is in the news for their fires. So, I mean, the risk really does shoot through the roof when, when you get a lot of rain in the winter and spring because that vegetation just grows like wildfire, you know, and it's it's huge um, fuel source. So that's a huge problem. I got to get go back to the oceans, okay? So, you know, four or five standard deviations above normal for the North Atlantic and over a long period of time. Um, I mean, we're talking incredibly warm temperatures. So there's a lot more moisture, um, obviously, being generated in the North Atlantic. And you think that would generate more clouds and you know block sunlight and sort of be a be a negative feedback you know stop the uh, warming but that doesn't seem to be happening you know according to Hanson we're having fewer of the clouds so I have to ask you because there's been a lot in the news recently about the ocean currents slowing down the AMOC shutting down perhaps now the models show I mean if the AMOC's actually shut down the North Atlantic temperatures will plummet and Western Europe coastlines could drop four degrees Celsius. The Maritimes in Canada, you know, a couple of degrees Celsius. You know, islands in the middle of the Atlantic, like Bermuda, you know, be two degrees Celsius drop. I know uh, that Bermuda, I've got a relative living in Bermuda and it's they've had incredible weather for the last year. It's been very, very cold around Bermuda and uh, they've had record numbers of storms, gale force winds. They'll go for weeks on end without even seeing the sun, which is very unusual for that little place in the middle of the Atlantic. So things are definitely shifting. So sort of a tug of war. I mean, do you think Hansen's correct with his sulfur ideas? Or is there some other mechanism maybe that you, you're thinking might be responsible? And, you know, <laughs> we could see a plummeting of those sea surface temperatures at the AMOC shuts down, and then it'll be difficult to grow food in Europe, for sure. Um, so that is the uh, the burning question, which is, why is this happening? And there certainly is a lot of evidence for um, the sulfur being a 
primary cause, maybe not all of it, but um, at least a, a primary cause. That and it's frustrating to see that ignored by some of the major climate scientists or dismissed. You know, I was just remarking that Michael Mann uh, said last um, June, I believe, or early July a year ago, that it was lack of Saharan dust that caused um, you know these temperature spikes and and. There was, uh, you know, there was Hunga Tonga was uh, possibly right. partial cause for that. El Nino may have been a partial cause. Um, and as you noted, there was uh, a lack of clouds where you would expect there to be. So there was sort of a, a persistent high that that kept the clouds from forming in a way that they might have otherwise. So all of these things have been sort of postulated as causes for this, but I mean, there, there is a cause, right? And the cause is the earth energy imbalance, which has been pumping up the ocean heat content like crazy for 20 years, right? So, so the ocean yeah. has all this heat in it. And that heat is, it, I mean, is, we've been lucky to have that heat buried by three consecutive years of La Nina. And, and maybe again, next year, it'll be buried to a certain extent. But, you know, we are um, essentially heating the oceans by the equivalent of about 12 Hiroshima um, nuclear bombs per second in, in heating, right? Now that's distributed over the entire <laughs> oceans, the, the north and south and to their depths. But but that that heating is, is going is ongoing and that heat is in the oceans that's ocean heat content it's going to come out so if we've been masking that by virtue of the sulf, uh the sulfates and the you know um been lucky because of la nina well all of that's in the past so i don't i don't want to i i don't feel like i'm a particular expert on the sulfur question um but mm -hmm. i could certainly uh acknowledge that this is not a surprise to see all this heat suddenly coming out. It's what we, it, it was in the bank and sooner or later we were gonna see it and, and now we're seeing it. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I've, I've seen a model with an AMOC shutdown. So if it, where, where the ice crosses the North Atlantic and almost gets as far as Ireland. Now, I really can't imagine that happening, you know, I mean, with all of the, you know, huge warming of, of that region, like, like the warming will decrease, but, you know, ice forming. I, I don't know. I think that model may, maybe needs to be revised. So well, it's a tug of war between a local sort of or, or, or a large scale regional effect like AMOC shutdown and then the overall warming of the of the uh, sea surface temperature. It's really fascinating. Let, let me add to something very quickly about the AMOC. I mean, one of the sort of um, misconceptions, as I understand it, is, is sort of the time scale over which the shutdown will occur and the time scale over which it'll have an impact. So whereas we are looking at, at decadal warming of 0.3 C, maybe up to 0.4 C up through 2040, right? The AMOC shutdown is, is um, on the order of 100 years that before the thing will yeah. shut down, we'll see these full impacts. So, so while that is true that eventually uh, Europe is going to be in a deep freeze, that seems like a certainty at this point, I, I wouldn't pit that against um, yeah. the near-term yeah. impacts uh, of the ocean heat content being released. So, uh, Elliot, um, uh, I, I really appreciate, greatly appreciate your contribution to uh, informing and, and alerting people. You really put things down well for people to understand in, in the Twitters. I very much appreciate the fact that um, you bring up um, the ocean heat and that uh, incredible amount of ocean heat that you are able to work out, you know, now, now you say it's 12, 13 Hiroshima bombs per second. And there's no question that uh, ocean heat is accelerating. And there's no question. And the uh, experts who measure the ocean heat, they have uh, said several times, pointed out that ocean heat is a far better indicator to use than global warming. Um, I think we should be using a combination of, of indicators. The International Geosphere Biosphere Project 15 years ago did that for a few years with a, four different indicators that put together as an index. And really, that's what we should be doing. Um, I also uh, appreciate your input on, uh, on uh, and Paul has already mentioned, um, that Earth energy um, imbalance um, should be used as an indicator. And um, interestingly, the big team who published the uh, last paper on uh, Earth energy imbalance, big, big paper, and they confirmed yet again 
that uh, the imbalance has doubled in the past um, 10, 14 years. I mean, that that's massive. That's huge. And you, you've already uh, talked about that. My question, uh, I, I, I guess, would, uh, would be, what's your feeling about, um, are you going to continue doing you know your contribution as you are or, or have you got any plans to go any further um I, i'm hoping that uh, uh, the uh, experts will um, come to life and uh, demand that our governments um, act to put ambitions into decline so what do you see your future for personally and collectively so that's a great question and uh it, it is a question really about my personality more than anything else um, you know, I was in the casino industry um, first as a player in the late 1990s and then as a professional for the industry for 15 years, finally retiring in 2017. And every day, this is true, I would get up, I would look at a game, I would figure out, is there a way to beat this game? How can I write a computer program to analyze this game? You know, I, I designed slot machines, I designed video poker, I designed table games, did their math, submitted, you know, submitted theirs for regulations, right? That's in the past, right? So now I get to wake up and I get to look for data. And the truth is you give me data and I am gonna find a way to express that data in a way that maybe nobody had thought of before. That's sort of like just part of how my mind works. I'm just always looking for new ways of viewing data and what can it tell us and what can we pull out of it, right? So my computation, of the uh, heating since the 1850 baseline is an example of that, right? I mean, nobody had done that before. It seems so obvious to me to do that computation and and nobody had done it. I had a graph on, on North Atlantic uh, sea surface temperatures that went viral, you know, got 8 million hits on Twitter. Um, that's crazy, right? Surely somebody should have just been putting out that data. Uh, you know, <laughs> why wasn't my graph yeah. that went... So when you ask that question, Peter, the answer is that that for me, it it is just how I operate as a human. I play some chess in the morning. I'm on lead chess, and I, I'll play a few one minute games, uh, um, and then I will op start opening up all the data sources and uh, always trying to think of a new way, a new way, a new way. So as long as there is data that um, knocks me over when I see it. I'm going to be trying to find a, a way to represent it that that will shed new light on it. And in the world in which we live, that's going to keep happening. I just want to mention that that big paper on Earth Energy Imbalance, you know what those guys did? They did a good thing. Uh, they put their paper together in shorthand and they, they um, um, submitted it as a presentation to the uh, UN Climate Secretariat. And you know what they said? To get Earth energy imbalance uh, heading in the right direction, we have to do 350 ppm atmospheric yeah. CO2. Yeah, Imagine no, it. no, that's not in our lifetimes. So uh, thanks. It's been great. Thank you, Peter and Elliot. And uh, now I'd, I know Paul has got some burning questions, so I'll hand it back to him. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, I do have a, a burning question about your, you wrote a book and uh, it was discussing how to basically win against the casino at all different games that they offer, how to find that little bit of an edge. I would have thought that would have made the casinos very annoyed at you, but instead of that, they, they offer you a lifetime achievement award. So can you, <laughs> can, you, can you enlighten us as to why they did that? So, so that's a really interesting question and I, I appreciate it so much. So you have to understand that inside a casino, there are, are essentially three different things going on. One are the people running the games you know, on the casino floor. The other is the management structure that, that's sort of operating the casino. And the third thing is surveillance, who are watching the games, who want to catch cheaters and advantage players and people are doing some scam or whatever. So when I wrote the book, the people on the floor right, who have to actually monitor the games, they don't like me, right, because I'm teaching people how to come in and beat the games. That makes their life harder. The people who run the casinos, uh, some of them like me, some don't, right? So um, some of them realize that that I'm giving information that helps players, and so I'm a bad guy, right? And others say, well, I'm giving information that helps the casino identify players, so I'm a good guy. 
But the people who like me are surveillance. And what you have to know about the people who are watching you through the eye in the sky is they love games. They love to learn games, learn how to beat games, learn how games could be scammed. They they just love games, right? And that's And that's so their life is watching people play games. So they are the ones that hire me. And so I would go actually around the world, essentially teaching people in surveillance how people were beating their games, right? So I was teaching the people who were watching people beat the games, how to find out that they're beating the games. And so, you know, it, it opened their minds to a bunch of different ways that games could be beaten that people hadn't thought of before. Just simple things like um, almost every single card in a deck of cards has an asymmetric pattern on the back of it. That allows you, if you um, manipulate the cards in the right way, to be, be able to identify certain cards. Um, mm -hmm. So cards come pre-marked from the factory. You know, just just conceptually, that alone would be an example of the kind of thing I could tell casino surveillance with demonstrations and so on. This is, you know, the group of people that I, I um, most sort of attuned with in my own life. They like to sit in a. a small space in front of a computer screen looking at data, you know? So I, you got to <laughs> like those people, right? So so they're the ones who gave me the Lifetime Achievement Award. Can you, uh, can you use this sort of gaming knowledge to, you know, if you're a, a young couple, you know, you have a lot of decisions. Do you have children? You know, a lot of young couples are deciding not to have children because they're, you know, a very uncertain future. You have to decide what sort of, careers to go into you have to decide where you're going to live right and under a rapidly changing climate these decisions are not so easy so i think it's a lot easier to know where you don't want to live like you don't want to live on a coastline you don't want to live near an area that gets flooded every time there's torrential rains right you don't want to live in the foot of a mountain where there could be landslides it's a lot easier to eliminate places and to to find places um, that that will be climate resilient like, so have you thought much about that? I mean, you're in California. That's one of the, you have everything. You have earthquakes, you have wildfires, you have yeah. atmospheric rivers. Um, yeah. You know, are, are you, are you uh, any, any place you think would be a lot better to live? So, yeah, I mean, the problem in Canada, of course, is going to be your, you know, you had the heat dome uh, a couple of years ago, and now you have the wildfires and, and you're going to, uh, you know, nowhere in Canada would be my answer. Um Nowhere south because of uh, wet bulb and, and um, you know, the sort of the tropical storms. Um, so nowhere between California and the equator. Um, there's actually been sort of three locations identified in the greater uh, U.S., 48 states, uh, that are relatively more preferable than other locations. One is the Pacific Northwest, which would be Seattle, Portland area, or a little bit inland from there. Um, another would be upstate New York, sort of away from the city where, where there um, is a little bit of moderation from, um, you know, the ocean temperatures coming in and, and you're not strictly in the snow belt there. So that's also been spoken about. But, but apparently the uh, best place in the United States, if you want to be a pre-refugee and move ahead, get ahead of the, the curve, <laughs> would be Wisconsin. Um, and there's a lot of talk about that. You can actually find people with YouTube channels that, that talk about <laughs> the best places to try and be a climate refugee in the United States. And, you know, um, there's some of these places don't want all these refugees, but they're already starting to move in there, right? They're you're already having this sort of um, climate smart people saying, oh, yes, I need to plan for my future. Uh, my ex-wife actually lives off grid in uh, southeast Ohio which I think is also a relatively safe place. There are um, definite places, you're right, in California, this is, uh, and I've spoken to my wife and, you know, Santa Barbara's beautiful. And by the time it gets bad enough so that we should leave, there will be no place for us to go. We've had our share of catastrophes here over the last few years, and they've been accelerating. You know, we had flooding rains last year and flooding rains again this year that have, have severely damaged uh, this part of the country. We had uh, a fire in 2017, the Thomas Fire at the time, which was the largest fire in the state ever recorded up through 2017. It's now ranks fifth largest in the state in 2024, <laughs> you know, state history. 
Um, mm -hmm. So we had a heat wave here where uh, just a couple of years ago, um, it got up to about 45 or 46 Celsius right at my house here, right in Santa Barbara on the coast. So uh, a heat waves, you can't believe, you know, we had a drought where our local reservoir got down to 7% full. Pretty much everything is happening here. Um, it is uh, what we don't have are our hurricanes because, but we did actually get, was it Hillary or something last year? That was yeah. a, you know, mm -hmm. the first um, sort of tropical storm. I think they downgraded it since then um, to, to hit this area. So we have that now, <laughs> you know, there were- I know, well, you haven't had an earthquake for a while. We have not had an earthquake one, so. in a while, but we so are, are well overdue thing. for that. Yeah. So yeah. this is not a great place to live if you're, uh, you know, trying to, to survive yeah. the apocalypse. Well, I, I think Canada is situated quite well, actually, because um, our population density is so low. I mean, our biggest concern with climate disruption is hordes of Americans coming coming across. I think we'll have to build a wall on the border. Good idea. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. It, it was it's been a great discussion. I can I just add one something uh, something to what you said much earlier in the uh, conversation, and maybe we can go back and forth if you have thoughts on this, but. The idea that the IPCC started out with the 1750 baseline, I actually tracked that down because, you know, there are some people who will argue that that was part of some fraud that was sort of being perpetrated on, on us to uh, change how much we've really warmed. I believe the language is they talk about the 30-year period centered on 1750, which would be 1735, 1765, more or less, uh, which actually 31 years. I never quite got how they got 30 years out of that. But... Actually, in the last, uh, the, the sixth assessment report, they, there was in one of the charts, it said that the heating from that through the 1850 to 1900 baseline was plus 0.1 C, plus or minus um, 0.2 C. So anywhere okay. from minus 1, 0.1 C up to plus 0.3 C, right? And and so, I mean, the idea is that um, there was not a very robust uh, methodology for tracking, you know, global temperatures at that time. And when you move to 1850 to 1900, you have a, you know, sort of much more uh, sense, global sense. You could be far more accurate knowing what the global temperature is. So for me, it makes perfect sense that they moved it up to 1850 to 1900. Mm -hmm. And we have this error bar if we want to go back a little further than that. Plus, you know, 1.5 is based on this 1850 to 1900 baseline, which, you know, curiously, it, it matters how they measured the temperature of water that they would pull out of the ocean in buckets. Bucket. You know, mm -hmm. isn't that, a, you know, that, that <laughs> did they account for evaporative cooling or, you know, what was the temperature of the bucket when, you know, so there, there is some fudge there, which is why, um, you know, Copernicus and Berkeley and, and Met and, you know, they all have different sort of, of baselines. They're relatively close to each other, but if you see any of these sort of comparisons between the different um, major groups, you you always notice that there's there's a little bit of yeah. a delta there too. That's great. Thank you so much, Elliot. I just have one little thing I'm curious because I know that you're a mathematician, but you're also a computer programmer. You're You're a person who has taught computer science. And so I wonder, like you mentioned that you like to analyze data. So do you do a lot of, uh, do you write a lot of programming? Do you do a lot of uh, programming at home or how do you do all these calculations? Well, pretty much everything is done with Excel now. And I use VBA, which is the programming language built into Excel um, for some things. Um, other than that, I just um, do straightforward Excel spreadsheet work using various uh, formulas freely available. Um, the one thing that I wish I could do, um, which is is those sort of the um, lowest, it's, it's hard to spell it or pronounce it correctly, uh, lowest smoothing, which is sort of, um, is it L-O-E-S-S -S or L-O-W-E-S-S? -S? Yeah, L-O-E-S-S, -S, yeah. Um, I wish I had that capability inside Excel. Um, you, there are add-ons you can buy for it, but they're maybe work, maybe don't. Um, so that would be the only thing that I, I sort of feel like I have a lack of that in my own work. You know, that would be very helpful uh, for some of these predictions. But other than that, everything just gets done in a straightforward way in Excel right now. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, 
you know, because I, I was kind of wondering, like, you're not in the realm of running these climate models, I presume, like the GIS model and all this kind of, kind of stuff? Or No, I don't I don't run any models myself. That takes a huge amount of computing power. I mean, the, the, it's massive to run those because essentially, you know, you grid off the whole planet. And then you have to sort of let the grid boundaries interact with their neighbors. And then you have to, you know, run that over the entire planet and run it a hundred times. These computations are so massive. Uh, it, it takes, you know, a university level computer bank to make those things happen. I'm taking the data other people have generated in good faith. I mean, one of the things that, that ir irritates me personally is this feeling that academics, that climate scientists have, have ill intent right? That they are purposely trying to mislead us. Um, as an academic, you know, as somebody who's published in journals, I have great respect for academics, great respect for the peer review process, for, for what it takes to get um, something published in a journal, especially a journal that, that has high credibility and a long standing in that, that discipline. So all of that is fine, right? What, what my argument would come down to is not what are the models producing, Right, but are the models accurate to begin with? Are they are are they taking enough things into account? Are they taking the right things into account? Are you know so so just for example, the ECS, right? The, this this fundamental number on which everything in our future is based, the the equilibrium climate sensitivity. If you assume it's two point seven or three, you know you get entirely different future out of these things, you know, than than Hansen's number. And and that's terrifying, right? That that you know, essentially, we don't account for the hot models. We sort of take away the hot models and pretend they don't exist, right? I, mm -hmm. I don't mean hot models. I mean hot, the models that produce hot temperatures. Sorry, <laughs> that joke has gotten very old by now. I'm sure. <laughs> um, you know, the, this idea that that somehow climate scientists are are purposely deceiving us. I don't believe that. You know, it's just not true. They, they might be very uh, strong headed about their beliefs and their beliefs might be wrong, but they're not, there's no intention there um, that I see. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jacobson. And uh, thank you, Paul. And also thanks to Peter. And also thank you to our audience for joining us here today. And if you learned something from this video, please consider liking the video. And if you haven't done so already, subscribing. And so we look forward to seeing you again on the next Climate Emergency Forum.